Buonasera. Good afternoon. Living without fear in an age of uncertainty. This is the title of a wonderful exhibition here at the Rimini meeting, and this is a reason uh, of the encounter and the exchange of ideas and opinions between three great personalities of uh, these times, of the current times, who accept to uh, think about themselves, being deeply uh, immersed in today's culture, whereby accepting uh, the challenge of, com of complexity. Julian Caron. And allow me to go on because actually we could uh, go on applauding our guests for more than half an hour, but we need to move on. We have Charles Taylor connected with us from remote. Uh, Mr. Taylor, you have uh, the applause and the uh, affection of the Rimini meeting and besides you we also have Mr. Rowan Williams also connected from remote. Well I believe that these applauses have uh, uh, helped you overcome uh, the distance between you and the fact that we cannot be all here. So let me spend a couple of words uh, about these three guests. First of all Charles Taylor. He's from Canada, from Quebec. He's a philosopher, a sociologist from more than 50 years and been investigating the process of uh, a formation of modern identity as well as the uh, characters and the complexity of a secularized society. Then Rowan Williams. He's Welsh. He is an Anglican priest, a poet and theologian. He led the Church of England as the Archbishop of Canterbury from 2003 to 2013. And Julian Caron, he's from Spain, from Extremadura. He is a Catholic priest and professor of theology. Since 2005, he has been the president of the Fraternity of Communion and Liberation. I have a question to the three of you. We have this title, Living Without Fear in the Age of Uncertainty. This title was chosen by the curators of the exhibition, by those who envisaged and kind of rebuilt your encounter as the necessary title to uh, give an answer to a crucial question, which is the following. Can we live in a contradictory world like ours, uh, characterized by uncertainty, without perceiving this uncertainty as an enemy? Rowan Williams, you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be able to take part in this encounter, and I'm very, very grateful to be here. Very briefly on this question, one of the biggest problems that we have is that sometimes we don't know how to identify the real enemy. We identify that enemy with some particular presence in the world, but in the Bible, the enemy, Satan, the prosecutor, the accuser is the one who tries to make us believe that God is not to be trusted. That's where the enemy really lies. Anything in our world, anything in our lives that prompts us to believe that God is not to be trusted, there is where the enemy really is. And so to confront the real spiritual enemy, 
we have always to ask that question. How do we discern those things that tempt us not to trust God? From the Garden of Eden to Christ in the desert, the devil, the enemy of humankind, constantly tells us, you can't trust God. You need to trust yourself. You need to think that you are the one on whom falls the responsibility of keeping the universe going. And that is, of course, the, de the deepest untruth that we could face. So, yes, let's find out where the real enemy is, and not imagine that it's to be found just in, as St. Paul says, the powers of flesh and blood in this world. Charles Taylor? Charles Taylor? In sala non sta arrivando la traduzione. Um, unfortunately, we do not hear you, Mr. Taylor. There are some technical problems. We don't hear Mr. Taylor. Molto uh, bene. Recuperiamo. Mr. Taylor, we can now hear you. Okay, now we can hear you. Continue in the same vein as the Archbishop a minute ago. I think that I want to introduce a concept of the, the ethical. This is not the ethical apart from the religious. It's a central ethical, it's a central part of religion. It concerns what it really is to be human. What, what is the proper fulfillment of human beings? And of course, as Christians, we see us created by God to be a certain kind of being. And they, my confidence is that you see our human race or human kind slowly growing and understanding what this means. You need to listen to, to get contact with what made us, who made us, in order to, to do this. So fear, yes, there's a lot of fear that one feels in the world and dangers from nature that we provoked and dangers from other human beings. But there always comes along some new further sense of what we really should be. I mean, we see in this world today the appalling massacres and hostilities and uh, calumnies from one group against another. But then in, our, in the previous century where you saw all those massacres, you also saw new prophets coming along. That is, people who understood the importance of nonviolence, of even winning independence, uh, winning a fight against oppression by nonviolent means, because violence breeds violence, and nonviolence can push us closer to what we were meant to be. And it's that sense of confidence that you have when you look at our history with, a, with that in mind. We're being, we're being educated by God, is the way I would like to put it, Santa Irenaeus, put, this, put it this way. It's, uh, education isn't over, it has many further steps to go, but there's a good side in which to engage the battles of our time. So not fear, but a sense of renewed engagement is what I feel it provokes in us. Echo. Julian Caron, so this uncertainty, is this the enemy? Or can we live uh, coping with this uncertainty? I believe that the alternative to perceive the uncertainty or any circumstance as an enemy is to perceive it as an opportunity. We perceive it as an enemy because somehow we believe that we have already experienced it and that there, there's no novelty, there's nothing new to discover there, that there is no possibility to discover something new or some opportunities to make adventures that we still don't know how will end. So if one accepts the challenge of something that is sometimes worrying, that is reason for concern or reason uh, for questions, well, the issue is 
uh, as Anna Haran says, is whether we are capable of turning any form of uncertainty, any crisis, uh, into the opportunity of posing ourselves new questions. If we try and answer these questions, well, then an opportunity opens up because these questions can kind of uh, uh, clear the way uh, and eliminate convictions that we thought were right and then open, up, open us up to new discoveries and help us uh, discover this opportunity uh, as well as something which is more essential to live. The only issue is actually whether we are loyal enough to uh, embrace this uh, fear without being uh, overwhelmed by it. And this is exactly also emerges from this situation of uncertainty. I have uh, seen the exhibition prepared by uh, some of our dear friends on TV series. Uh, so the human nature has been kind of uh, decomposed, but the, the, the self, the person, is actually unreducible. And all of this triggers the need we have for meaning. And probably in an era uh, characterized by the lack of challenges would have never been there. Actually, there is a fact. Uh, Julian Caron says that these challenges uh, uh, could have probably been uh, felt uh, not so strong uh, but actually, what we have uh, lived over the last 18 months has, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, has uh, increased uh, the meaning of a pandemic. So I would like to ask uh, uh, all of you, Ms. Rowan Williams, uh, even if we come from this kind of experience, can we imagine to live without fear or do we need to do something else? There are different kinds of fear, I believe. There's a fear to which we react by saying, I must protect myself. And picking up what Father Caron was saying, that means I must protect myself from changing. The way I am is the way I ought to be, and I've got to defend that. But there's another kind of fear, which is what you might call a rational, a reasonable fear, to which my response is, well, I must change. If somebody tells me that my lifestyle is such that I will make myself ill, that I will die prematurely, then I may well be afraid, but I have some choices. I can change. I can actually live in a way which is more in tune with how my body and my world really work. So I think the question that we face is not how do we live without fear totally, because perhaps that would be an impossibility. But how do I set aside the fear that makes me panic and defend myself and think instead about the changes I can make and need to make under the hand of God and by the grace of God so that life becomes more possible? So, no, we don't ever live entirely without fear. Fear is one of the things which keeps us alive. But keep our focus on life rather than on defending ourselves as sacred and unchangeable. And perhaps, perhaps we understand how to use fear constructively. So your approach is completely different. So Juliana, this is a completely different approach to fear. Yes, that's true because fear uh, comes upon us when reality highlights our inability, our being powerless. Sometimes we are arrogant. We believe that we can do it, we can make it. But sometimes when uh, we are faced with something that challenges us beyond our ability to measure it, then, then our uh, ability, our power, emerges and we can see this in children they 
can be calm, but then if they're faced uh, with a situation that they do not know, if they're faced with the dark, then they they're tempted to cry, they're tempted to look for their mother, and then with the support of their mother, they can enter any dark room because they're certain that they're being accompanied. So the fundamental issue for them to um, uh, beat fear is not something that we can control with our strategies. The more the the more life challenges us, uh, the more we can see whether we are accompanied by uh, a presence, whether we are we're supported by a presence, like uh, the presence of the mother who supports her child, because that's the picture, the image of uh, uh, someone who wins against fear. So there's no reasoning, there's no rule, there's no constriction which can win over the deep fear that sometimes emerges uh, that we have uh, oftentimes seen during the pandemic. And I often uh, think that the only issue is that we need to actually look for uh, supportive presences like the mother for her child uh, or the disciples with Jesus when they are on the boat uh, in the middle of the storm. Uh, and they're full of fear, and Jesus uh, sleeps peacefully. Well, they are, and, and he's amazed uh, of the fact that they have not yet understood who was with them. And so he asks, why do you have fear? Haven't you understood yet? Haven't you understood who I am? So Charles Taylor, this fear has almost become some kind of a provocation to live more, to raise oneself's question. How do you uh, consider this? It's saying essentially the same thing as God do, but in different different words. The, what is really terrible is paralyzing fear, the sense that, as the disciples had in the boat there. We can't do anything about it. It's coming at us. And when you think of one of the really great dangers, the dangers of our planet turning unlivable, which we see more and more evidence of in this summer in North America, these tremendous fires. Uh, yes, a lot of people, they just can't take it. So what they do is they turn off. They turn off, they watch the hockey game, they watch the football game. Uh, but there is a, a possible reaction to fear, which is we know what to do. We just have to set ourselves to do it. And that's, of course, the case with global warming. It's just evident, the basic kind of program that we need. So if we get, if we find ourselves not with paralyzing fear, but the fear that galvanizes, and that I think is a real place for people who have a leadership role in our society. They should be saying, we can beat this. I mean, we, we only beat this if we get together and we take certain measures, which obviously will respect our planet. And in that way, fear becomes a motivation. That kind of fear becomes the motivation for taking a step further, for going further on in the plan of God, because it obviously was the plan of God that we would be stewards in this universe, not destroyers of it. Right? So we have to win people away from paralyzing fear. In front of well, after all, this fear is a very tangible one. It is a fear that has been connected uh, uh, so much with the pandemic, and it is just uh, uh, the one of the closest examples of a bigger sense of fear, which is the uh, need to actually having to cope with something that is so distant uh, from us uh, and with things uh, uh, against which actually we feel a great sense of uncertainty. Every day we live in a new world, in a world uh, that we find difficult to codify. And yet there are symbolic places which tell us in a very symbolic way uh, what new developments we're dealing with. Let's watch them. <laughs>
Mike Kochers. So Charles Taylor, these images seem to tell us something. That is to say, the fact that we have definitely become a de-Christianized society, or rather, as you define it in your book, the secular age, that we have entered the secular age. So I would like to ask you something impossible. Can you please tell me in just one minute what you mean by secular age? That you took actually such a big book to describe. 65 seconds, but I think uh, we can we can get it quite clearly. It's really because we lived in Christendom, that is society, which is meant in every aspect, political, artistic, and so on, to be to reflect, to be dominated by the Christian faith. And we've been living in that in Western Europe, and it's a dependent to societies like mine since uh, since Constantine. And there were great things about that, but we had to grow beyond it. And the growing beyond it means putting an end to Christendom. That is putting an end to the automatic correlation between being a citizen of Britain and the, and the Anglican Church or a citizen of Geneva and the, the Calvinist Church. We had to break that to open an age of real spiritual searching to go beyond that. And the secular age, in my, uh, my standpoint, is the opposite of Christendom where there is freedom to pursue one's deep spiritual searching. And that is going to take us a step beyond what Christendom made possible. Because of this, and actually thank you very much, because actually you could have been the only one uh, capable of giving such a very effective summary. I would like to read out a passage, an excerpt of your book that may help us uh, continuing this narration together. At a given step, you say that, uh, and I quote, only by identifying the change as one of the lived experience uh, can we even begin to put the right questions properly and avoid the naivete on all sides. Either that unbelief is just the falling away of any sense of, fallen, of fullness, or the betrayal of it, where theists sometimes attempted to think of atheists, or that belief is just a set of theories attempting to make sense of experiences which we all have. Uh, and what real nature can be understood purely imminently, what atheists are sometimes tempted to think about theists. So then, isn't it that in the face of this de-Christianization, both believers and non-believers uh, uh, are asking the wrong questions? Uh, Charles Taylor. Yeah, I think they're looking at it from the point of view of Christendom. So they, they're so, uh, both sides have been so hypnotized by this that a lot of uh, Christians who are fearful about this think that everything's going to the devil because of the, the whole point of a successful full Christian society is to have everybody engaged. So if people start disengaging, then we're losing. And the, the other side, exactly the same error is made by uh, the very uh, uh, were, uh, militant atheists. They say, hooray, hooray, more people are falling away from the church. That means that they're falling away from religion altogether. And neither side can see this extraordinary mutation which is actually taking place. The, a, a whole range of spiritual seekers and spiritual seekers have a new kind of relation with each other than in the past. They're not cursing each other. They're trying to understand each other. They're trying to learn from each other. And so these, these two groups, very conservative Christians and militant atheists, are totally blinded to what's going on right in front of their eyes. Certo. Uh, Caron, quindi può essere da... So, Julian Caron, can this, uh, can the topic be that we need to start from the wrong presuppositions, uh, that we pose ourselves the wrong questions. Well, I think that uh, this also happened, as uh, Charles Taylor says, uh, oftentimes uh, we do not start from uh, truly lived experiences. But the fact is that uh, we have preconceptions. We make ourselves uh, our own image of uh, reality of what Christianity has to do, uh, of what Christianity really is, or of what life without Christianity is. 
So we need to have something that uh, creates a common experience for everybody. And the pandemic has been something that has uh, enabled everybody to have a shared experience. Uh, so uh, the pandemic has affected everybody. We've all been challenged in one way or the other directly or indirectly, but we've all shared the same common experience. And we've all seen that the questions we had posed ourselves were right, that they were common to everybody. It's not that actually a group of persons had one question to pose and the others another. We were all posed against the same challenge. And therefore, we could actually check uh, our preconceptions, our presuppositions. Uh, we put them to the test. And against this check, we had the possibility of starting a dialogue because we have been able to share with the other what is really needed to live. There is a common ground and we have the chance to discuss of uh, a common experience. Rowan Williams, do you also share this idea that experience is the common ground and not rather the area of kind of naive theoretical questions that do not direct us towards the right path to embark on? A lot of sympathy with, with that because it does seem to me that sometimes the question of belief or unbelief is just posed as if it were a question of a yes or no to a very simple set of propositions. But what we've been hearing, both from Charles Taylor and from Father Caron, <clears throat> is that people are in search of how they adjust themselves, reconcile themselves to life itself, to reality itself. How do we live in the truth? That's the question. And that's where dialogue really begins. How do we live in a way which is, in some sense, in tune with the reality around us and the reality beyond and within that, ultimately with God? How do we live truthfully recognizing who we are and what kind of beings we are? How do we create truthful, transparent relations with one another such that we're not, to use Charles Taylor's words, paralyzed by fear of one another? So I think it's absolutely right that we frequently ask the wrong questions or we don't wait long enough to find out what the questions are that others are really asking. And that's something which both believers and non-believers repeatedly do. They think they know what the questions are that the others are asking and often they don't. And we need to sit down and listen about that. And I think finally, there's a lot of wisdom in the formulation used by one of the great Greek religious thinkers of the present time, uh, Christos Yanaras of Athens, who says we have to remember Christianity isn't a religious system. It's a matter of inhabiting the body of Christ, living in the church, and the church not as an institution, but as the sacramental and spiritual reality that puts us in touch with truth. It's the living of that which we proclaim and announce, not a triumphant theory. And this is really the topic, actually, living with reality, posing ourselves the questions, and understanding the value of one's own freedom, however, at uh, a time in which the word freedom is taking on more and more unprecedented and sometimes disconcerting meanings. Uh, so new faces, disconcerting faces uh, that bring us back to uncertainty, to that dimension of uncertainty, to the original question we started from. Let us try and watch these faces.
Brasile, la gigantesca manifestazione di protesta per denunciare il degradarsi delle condizioni in cui vivono le tribù originarie della regione amazzonica. Gli studenti della statale occupano l'università per solidarietà con gli operai in lotta. I think all women should learn how to use a firearm and carry with them on a regular basis. È la sfida più grande del secolo, è la sfida più grande che i giovani abbiano mai dovuto affrontare. Sono piante naturali, eh, come lo è il peperoncino, come è la frutta. Siamo contro l'Europa perché è la mancanza di democrazia, è contro i popoli, è per affamare i poveri. Tutti i governi sono sottomessi da questa oligarchia transnazionale pedosatanista. I thank the pasta and the sauce and the meatballs, for they provide me with all my needs. Amen. So, Rowan Williams, uh, it is quite clear that this word, freedom, entails a real babble, uh, a real set of uh, uh, ideals, in a way. And it is increasingly difficult to understand what the idea of freedom is for the people who live our time, uh, the idea of freedom that they can recognize themselves in. That there are at least three levels at which we can think about freedom. There's the level that's probably most immediate for a lot of people these days, which is the freedom to acquire, the freedom to have. I need to have the liberty to gain and to hold on to what I desire. And a lot of people, when asked about that and when they're asked to, to think about that, will say, well, that can't be the whole story that can't be an adequate version of freedom, just to be a consumer. And so people then talk about the freedom to be who they really are. And I think very often that's a morally serious question. Do I have the liberty in this social context really to be who I believe I am? And that's a step forward, but I would say it's not the last word, because If we are indeed made in the image of God, then to be human is also to be free to give and to give life. And so I would say that the concept of freedom, which is most comprehensive, most ultimately most significant for us as human beings, is how we create and nourish and protect that freedom to give life. And I wonder whether that's something we should, as Christian believers, be talking about rather more. Not certainly, not just the freedom to have, but not even just the freedom to be, but also the freedom to, to live out that divine image of life giving. And I suspect that if we pressed this question, maybe more people than we would expect might rally around that idea of the ultimate freedom, the really significant human freedom, being that freedom to bring others to life. And when some people have talked about, like uh, St. John Paul II talked about living in a culture of death, people sometimes object to that and think it's, it's a bit melodramatic, but it's a good reminder, a good wake-up call that we really need to have a very comprehensive, very deeply rooted sense of ultimate freedom, authentic freedom, being that creative, generative freedom, which we receive from God and which we exercise in the image of God and which we're liberated to exercise 
by the reality of Jesus Christ in whom we live. So, Ro Williams says that there is a freedom that goes beyond having and being, a freedom that actually can give life to the others and that kind of broadens up our, uh, our view. And that's the opposite of the kind of freedom that we sometimes can decide to forget to uh, entrust ourselves to those who decide on our behalf. So in this respect, I think that the admonition that we had heard from the Grand Inquisitor of Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, actually, as you can see, I'm uh, showing you yet another pamphlet, so to say, another very small volume. I'm, I'm talking, I'm making quotations from such uh, uh, big books. Uh, but uh, I'd like to uh, actually remind you about what the Grand Inquisitor said. He said, and I quote, we shall persuade them that they will only become free when they renounce their freedom to us and submit to us. And shall we be right or shall we be lying? They will be convinced that we are right for they will remember the horrors of slavery and confusion to which thy freedom brought them. So, Charles Taylor, how much courage does it take not to hand over one's freedom to the powers, to the powers uh, and that be, and then to be able to say I, uh, so that we uh, are in line of the title of the meeting, the courage to say I. Something very deeply paradoxical about this, which I think really uh, Rowan pointed out, that is that uh, real freedom doesn't have that much to do finally with choice, right? Yes, there is a, a creating the antecedent conditions of freedom very often involve throwing off the yoke of some uh, foreign power or some uh, dictatorial power. But the ultimately important freedom, the one that Dostoevsky is, is really uh, demanding that we have, is something that's only exercised by a sense, another kind of sense of necessity, is that, I'm, that I'm really called to be a certain kind of being, that the, the very depths of my nature I feel called upon. And so it's not a choice anymore. I am chosen. At the, at the deepest level. But at the, any lesser level, there is a temptation to, if one is afraid of life, to give up one's power to decide what to do for very bad reasons, as the, the, the Dostoevsky describes in that famous passage. And there's a lot of grand inquisitors around. There's a lot of forces and institutions who think that I'll protect you from sin, I'll protect you from going wrong if you just follow these rules and just you know try to live up to these standards. So you have to throw off that kind of yoke. But strangely enough, it doesn't come down to your choice in the end. Real freedom is something that is called out of you by, I, I think, God. Caron, Julian Caron, how easy is it to try and entrust our liberty, to put our liberty in the hands of a system of power rather than focusing on the I and build ourselves our own pathway of freedom? Well, power, be it lay or so secular or clerical, tries to convince us that we will be better off if we renounce our freedom. It is as if uh, we wanted to simplify our life. So if you renounce your freedom, then you can avoid risks. You avoid making mistakes. You avoid actually complicating your life. Uh, and therefore, it is much better to entrust someone else uh, and to give someone else this risk. And actually, power is happy of this. Dostoevsky's uh, genius 
lies in the fact that once and for all he unmasked the lie of power. As he unveiled the capacity of uh, actually creating images and suggestion as these kind of lies can uh, induce us that uh, we are confronted by risks. I will always uh, remember a sentence by Father Giussani, uh, a free saving, would it be still something free? So. This tells you how much this uh, proposal that Dostoevsky uh, has unveiled is actually a lie. At the same time, however, uh, freedom is not only the, has not only to deal with courage because we cannot uh, give ourselves courage. So, what is freedom? What can make us free? What kind of experience are we called upon to live? in order not to be subdued to the cause of power or to the wills of powerful people. So you make an experience of freedom when your wishes are fulfilled. So what's the main issue here? The issue is that human wishes are so manifold. They are unlimited. They are they have no boundaries and so the issue is what can make man truly free so either men are fulfilled truly fulfilled to such an extent that they can be free from power or they or men will always be tempted to be subdued to power in order to participate in the advantages that power offer them uh, uh, as a compensation for true liberty. And I think this is the choice that we're all called upon to make. It is not enough to simply uh, demonstrate in, uh, in favor of freedom on the streets. Uh, it's not enough that actually there are other people promising me to be free. Our heart uh, is not subdued because it is unreducible. And so we make an experience of freedom when there is uh, fulfillment and this experience truly uh, frees us from power. Of course, power in any field, at work, in the family, in the church, in any situation in which men are challenged. In certain situations, it is indeed very easy to say that we are free, but then in the end, we are free only in our, in our own room where nobody disturbs us. Actually, the issue is that we have to be free in reality where we are confronted with huge challenges. So either we make a, a tangible and true experience of uh, fulfillment or we are constantly looking uh, from the advantages that come from any field of power. And this is then indeed the way that we kind of uh, uh, get away from a system of rules and try and make this step forward and uh, reach the possibility in a situation in which we can truly say the courage to say I. This encounter we're having this afternoon is based on the stories and on the thoughts of three great personalities who at a given point uh, uh, got intertwined and they are communicated in the exhibition, and I'd uh, suggest that you go and see the exhibition. This exhibition has become an installation. It uh, tells uh, uh, of an experience, and it stems from four professors uh, who had a number of encounters, a number of meetings, uh, who actually uh, met with you, and so I thought it was uh, so interesting that I asked the curators themselves uh, to tell us how this session 
was organized, uh, a session, a meeting that is telling about actually stories of faith and of thought that are so different one from the other, which, however, uh, have contributed to such an interesting question. I am Alessandra Gerolini and I teach philosophy at the University Catholic University of the Sacred Heart. My name is Piede Simone and I teach ancient philosophy at the University of Trier in Germany. I am Samuele Busetto and I teach history and philosophy in high school in the province of Treviso. In 2006, as you will probably remember, I was in England and I met John Milbank, an Anglican professor of philosophy and theology who started asking me questions. And, and then, at a certain point, I told him about the communion and liberation movement. And then, at that point, he said, this is exactly the answer. This is the answer I was looking for. In fact, then you involved all of us. We studied together at the Catholic University, and that's when a friendship really began with conferences, etc. We even went so far as to do the School of Communion and Liberation with the Anglicans, and we went uh, once a month to the UK. Then in 2011, I met Rowan Williams. I was at a conference in Oxford, and then through our friend John Milbank, we had a dinner that evening which was the beginning of a friendship that then involved all of you and Julian Caron. And then I was sent to the United States and started uh, sowing this seed on friendship on the other shore of the ocean. And it was from these relationships that Julian Caron and Williams then got to know each other and started talking together. And then Taylor came along. Yes, that was um, another one of our absolutely unexpected encounters in 2015. We were in Rome, and during a conference, I met him by chance. At that point, he asked if he could attend the communion and liberation audience of the Pope, which was totally unplanned, and he actually invited himself, and uh, we were all there. Yes, and even Rowan Williams, we were all there. Why the exhibition? We didn't actually come up with the idea. Actually, it came about during the dialogue between Har Caron and Taylor, and we immediately thought of involving Williams, uh, another person who is not afraid of reality or of the other. And then the idea was to do an exhibition that would allow everyone to enjoy and enter into the dialogue that was born between us and between them. We wanted this to be a gift not only for us, but for everyone. And actually, we are actually benefiting of this gift. Lo stiamo vivendo tutti e non a caso. So we are all actually experiencing this, uh, this gift. And as a matter of fact, you wanted to close the exhibition with a quote uh, from Don Giustani, who speaks of the inevitable sympathy between people who are presences. So I would like to ask uh, the three of you whether this is true, because we need to uh, double check to make sure that things have really gone this way. And then I would like to know if you believe this is uh, first sign of a possible hope, uh, because when experiences uh, get intertwined, when they generate uh, moments of thoughts uh, and prospects, well, then that means that there is a, a moment of, uh, of hope. Uh, Charles Taylor. Yes, and in my case, uh, John Milbank turns out to be a crucial figure. I met him when he came to Montreal. I think I read his book, Theology and Political uh, Social Theory, and then we continued the conversation and eventually he introduced me to Rowan Williams and then to precisely in 2015 to members of the of Comunio e Liberazioni. So you see, I mean, the message here is that we all very much need each other, that we need some kind of point of exchange which can help us to clarify. In my case, very muddy ideas at the beginning can be clarified and strengthened by that kind of exchange. We really need each other. Yeah, we see the communication of the face and uh, the non-body language that uh, we could see that uh, uh, they told us a real story. We could uh, see you smiling. So, Rowan Williams, that's how it went. But what is generating this meeting, this encounter? I think that behind our conversation and our relationship lies a, a shared conviction 
that faith is a reality that introduces us into a larger world. Not only a larger world than any one of us inhabits alone, but a larger world than human language itself can cope with. To me, the most important thing that can ever be said about the practice and the language of faith is that it opens up that, that larger world. We are more than we know. We live in a world that is more than we know. We are more than we know. And above all, we are in relation with a God who is more than we could ever know. And I think that's something which in our conversations and our relationships, we have found a deep resonance with between one another. And that's, I suppose, what I first sensed in my first contacts with Comunione Liberazione, that sense of a faith which genuinely looked for a larger world to live in. Julian Caron. Well, it was a, a sort of a, a random event, as our friends, uh, curators of the exhibition, told us. The circumstances uh, came about uh, up to uh, ending in this uh, event, uh, this evening, where we, uh, the three of us, uh, are participating, and. Uh, the interesting thing is this uh, feeling of uh, having had these exchanges and uh, meeting with the others. We got together with a uh, resonance, uh, as uh, Don Giussani also mentions in his uh, books, a unique resonance, a unique resonance indeed. He says that uh, there is the same resonance that is ineffable and total before things. It's not that we had an agreement beforehand. Even the situation of the pandemic made it more difficult to meet. We had to have our interviews in our own countries of residence. However, the final result uh, was this kind of surprise for ourselves of this uh, resonance that, as uh, Father Giussani says, uh, is uh, an inevitable sympathy. And as uh, Father Giussani says, uh, everybody can see up to what point, uh, to what extent this is a good for everybody. We can see that in this uh, cultural context, uh, each of us can establish relationships if we are attentive, if we are careful to catch uh, the other's vibrations that can uh, express the most profound things that we have in common and which makes uh, our relationships so deep uh, as uh, the one that we are having this evening. Well, I believe that those who have the privilege to be here in presence in this hall and all the people connected and all those who will watch the recording of this session can have the sense, the feeling of this resonance that you uh, were talking about. Before closing our session, I would like to invite you to go back to the point of departure to think about maybe in just one minute uh, uh, how to proceed from here. So, in your view, human experience or the Christian experience, what does it do? Does it look at secularization as a defeat, as a challenge, or as an opportunity? Ron Williams, is it a challenge, a defeat, or an opportunity? I think my short answer would be it's a vocation, it's a calling from God. And so it's a gift. If we think of it as defeat, we think there's a struggle that depends just on us. If we just think of it as a challenge, we perhaps don't fully understand that it is God who is waiting for us and relating to us through this situation. And if we just think of it as an opportunity, well, perhaps we don't think of it as something that's already given and already done for us. But when we talk about God's calling, that's God's gift of inviting us into a new depth of relation with God and with God's world. So let's perhaps start with that. It's a vocation. It's a gift. Julian 
Julian Carron. Following your words, it is a sort of challenge that becomes an opportunity. Uh, we didn't look for it. Uh, as Rowan said, it is a call uh, coming from reality, and we can see that there is a design behind it. But we know this insofar as we get engaged, we get involved. What does this mean for me, uh, this opportunity? Uh, before the secularization. Well, this secularization is calling on us to go beyond uh, our natural reality of being humans, of being men and women. We see it in many respects. We see it uh, emerging very powerfully, for example, uh, in Wellebeck's work in Scholars, where there is this need to be loved despite all the nihilism that can be found around us. There is this possibility to fully understand our nature as human beings. Is a possibility for Christians to understand the true nature of Christendom, and not as a set of rules that is not able to uh, respond to this uh, uh, need that is emerging more and more in this cultural need in this particular moment of history. It is a possibility to perceive it in its very nature, as it is, as a meeting with an exceptional reality that is present, that is historical, and that makes us have an experience that is so fulfilling that we could not even conceive it. Charles Taylor, after many years uh, reflecting on this uh, uh, idea of secularization, what is your answer? Yeah, I really very much agree with the previous two speakers. I would perhaps put it this way. It's, a, it's an invitation to grow. It's an invitation to grow in the faith. So it's an invitation to enter certain realities that we didn't manage to enter properly before. Uh, it's, so it has the elements of a challenge. I mean, any invitation to, to grow has a really put, puts you in a position where you have to respond and we don't always respond in the best possible way but I see it as that opening and that's what I find tremendously exhilarating in the secular age. Thank you, because this call for growth, this sense of call um, for the challenge, we have felt it, we have sensed it very strongly. And there is a journey that we can continue in the meeting of Rimini because we can visit the exhibition. But let me say that uh, uh, we have been staying uh, with the very important personalities that love the human contact and uh, the dream of all the people present here today is to have you once again here in Rimini to continue to talk and to define guidelines and to share discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you.